What I'll be uh, talking about today is uh, the uh, Boeing 737 MAX crashes, or as I like to say, how Swiss cheese killed four, 346 people. A lot of you probably heard of Swiss cheese, but it's Professor James Reason from the University of Manchester postulated there's never one single thing that causes an aircraft accident. So it's invariably a chain of events that are all linked and he came up with this analogy of Swiss cheese to help sort of explain and, and investigate how the accidents may have occurred and also, you know, other ways that we can get the message out to, uh, to prevent these things happening. And I'll talk about that in the context of these, these two crashes that no doubt we've uh, all heard about. I'll try and keep the, the technical detail just down the minimum. I see around a few places that probably aren't pilots, so we'll keep that down if I can. 28th of, sorry, 28th of October in 2018, a 737 MAX took off from Jakarta, Lion Air 610. Shortly after takeoff, uh, the, they made a few garbled calls indicating they're having some technical difficulties. Um, they're observed to have erratic flight path, and shortly thereafter, they crashed into the sea. Daylight, good weather, almost a brand new aircraft, 189 people died. Pretty well, uh, the blame game always starts straight away, so. Boeing blamed the pilots, of course. The airlines blamed Boeing. CNN blamed ISIS. The well, pilots, they were dead. They couldn't blame anybody. But it wasn't long before this acronym MCAS started getting bandied around. MCAS. Now, I was flying the 737-800 at that stage. I'd never heard of it. So, anyway, more on that later. Four months later, out of uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopian 302, a 737 MAX took off indicated they had a problem with flight controls or something, erratic flight path, not long after, crashed into the ground. Almost a copy and paste of the first one. Again, good weather, brand new aircraft, 157 people died. So it wasn't long before uh, airlines countries started banning the MAX. China, of course, you probably uh, expect it, being American aircraft. China were the first to ban it, other countries followed suit, and last of all was the US, the manufacturer of the aircraft. They decided that they had to ban it too and try and find out what was happening. So again, we're, we're asking how can two brand new aircraft, state of the art, good weather conditions, crash in almost identical situations. So we'll have a look at uh, what this Swiss cheese is. Now essentially, think of, of, of the layers of cheese as a layers of defence. And they've all got random holes. So if you're going to shine, I guess, a light through it, the light gets through the first layer of cheese, and if it strikes a solid part of the, the second piece of cheese, it stops. But if somehow all those random holes in those layers of cheese, however many there might be, line up, light gets through, and in this case, the accident happens. So let's look at these four layers of cheese. Um, look, I'll, I'll just talk with that out. Let's think of the first layer of cheese as the aircraft manufacturer of Boeing. The second layer of cheese is the regulator, the Federal Aviation Administration. The third layer is the airlines. And the fourth layer is the pilots. So let's start with Boeing. 1967, they introduced the, uh, the Boeing 737. And that was very quickly uh, a bestseller. In 1988, Airbus came along and they were the new guy on the block and they introduced the A320. Now I think Ford versus Holden as a direct competitor. In 2010, they introduced the A320neo, which is the new engine option. And this was a real game changer. It, basically, they were eating the 737 for lunch. And by 2016, Airbus had 1,400 more Airbus Neo orders on the books than Qantas had, sorry, than, than uh, Boeing had for the, uh, the 737. At that stage, the offering from uh, Boeing was the 800 or the NG, and it was getting eaten. Now, that's all, what's it always about? It's always about the money. So, to try and catch up, you know, to, get, to go back to the drawing board, to try and design a new aircraft, build it, whatever, it's gonna take a long time, a lot of money, and they're not gonna catch up. So, what was Boeing's answer? Well, let's put some bigger, more fuel-efficient engines on the basic 737, give it a few other tweaks, and we'll call it the Boeing 737 MAX. Simples. So you can see there, top photo is the, 
the uh, 737-800NG with a, uh, the Max. So bigger engines, different winglets, a few tweaks on the, uh, the flight deck, and that was essentially, it. That, that was their answer to the A320. However, they're design problems. The engines, to be more uh, efficient, fuel efficient, are bigger. Now the, the, the 737 has lower ground clearance than the, uh, than the Airbus, so putting the bigger engines on was going to be a problem. So to fit them on, they moved them forward and up a little bit on the pylons. Done. Except what that did was that shifted the, the moment arm a little bit, and they realised that there was a tendency with these more powerful engines at low speed to cause the aircraft to perhaps pitch up a little bit. And they recognised there was a, 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 uh, an issue here that perhaps it might be exposing the pilots to uh, low speed and possible stall. So what they decided to do was to design this MCAS. The software engineers designed a mod for the flight control computers to fix the problem. So what it was, Boeing's answer to a hardware problem was software. So let's talk about this MCAS. It's the Maneuvering Control Augmentation System. And what Boeing decided was, look, there's very slight chance that a pilot might get caught out with a pitch up, <laughs> slow speed, too much thrust. So we'll design this system to counter that. So basically, um, if there's anyone, any pilot here that I have to explain Anglo Attack and Stall, you're probably at the wrong lunch, but there's <laughs> probably a few people who don't do it. But you've got the basically the, uh, the airflow relative to the fuselage and the wing. And as you slow down, that angle increases to maintain lift. You get to a critical angle. Doc, what's the angle? Stall, 16 degrees here. You get this critical angle, but the airflow starts to break away over the top of the wing. The aircraft loses lift and in the worst, worst case resembles a falling leaf. So what they decide, no, they had to, had to prevent this happening. So what the, sense the uh, software engineers did, they came up with this MCAS. So if you hit detect it through the angle of attack vane on the, on the uh, side of the aircraft, that, that that angle was too high, what this MCAS would do, would, would use the, the horizontal tar, which on the 737 was a whole moving stabiliser, with the other ones at the back. It would, what it would do if it detected it, it would raise, basically move to raise the tail lower the nose, and essentially reduce the problem. But again, they're thinking, well, it, it, it's a, it may hardly ever be needed, pilots don't need any input, so we'll just design it just here in the dark in the corner, and it'll just happen automatically in the background. Critical thing here that I'll mention later on, part of the, um, the conditions for this to operate was it had to be manual flight, like no, auto, no autopilot, and the flaps had to be up. So to satisfy those conditions, and was signaled from the angle of attack vane, nose is too high, it would activate. However, <coughs> Boeing's strategy here was to get this aircraft certified and out, competing with the NEO as soon as possible. But they needed to convince the regulator, the FAA, and the airlines that it's just another 737. Because if there's too many differences, the regulator says, oh no, that, that's a different type. You're going to need training on, for your crews, you're, you're going to need a specific endorsement. Again, that's all money. A lot, a lot of the big airlines, particularly Southwest, which uh, big American airline basically was almost telling Boeing what to do. They've got virtually, still had flying every model 737 that, that had been built. And they wanted their pilots to be able to go out on one license and whatever model was on the end of the aero bridge for the day, they'd go and fly it. They didn't want the MAX to be a different thing so you only have a small pool of pilots. They didn't want simulators or anything like that. So they decided that all you needed for an existing 737 rated pilot was to do a one hour differences course on iPad. Unbelievable. And they decided that that's all they needed. And also with this MCAS, because it was automatic, it was there just to protect the pilots, they didn't need to know about it. So they deliberately removed all reference from the manuals. So it didn't exist, except the software engineers and people who built it. So we're through the first stage of cheese. So let's now come back to the, uh, the second stage of, uh, of the Swiss cheese, which is the regulator, the FAA. Does this sound familiar? They're underfunded, short-staffed, and basically they left all of the, the oversight to Boeing. 
you've been building aeroplanes for a long time, just tell us what you want to do and then you go away and build it. They did not vigorously uh, check everything and make sure that it was, it was up to scratch. So essentially they had, they got the, obviously the, the original design concept from Boeing, but they were just so Kurt cosy, it was like giving the, the keys, of, you know, the brewery keys to the drunk. So after the initial uh, draft approval, what they didn't know that subsequently happened, Boeing developed this MCAS, found it wasn't enough, they increased the authority of this MCAS, or the, the power of it, by a factor of four from what they originally told, uh, told the FAA. It was only receiving input from one sensor, and that was the angle of attack vane on the captain's side. Everything else normally on an airliner is double, triple redundancy. One sensor. So if the sensor's bad, guess what? No failure modelling was carried out to say what if that one sensor fails or feeds in um, bad information, what might happen down track? It just it wasn't done. And again, they swallowed what, what Boeing told them. Such low probability, don't need to know about it. So they rubber stamped the removal of any reference from the manuals. So you've now got a, a very dangerous design flaw through the first layer of tea, tree, uh, cheese and out to unsuspecting airlines. Now the, the test pilots in Boeing, they knew that this was a problem. They weren't happy with how it worked. They weren't happy with the fact there was no warning to the pilots. The, the training path of one hour on an iPad weren't happy with. And th an internal memo actually came out in 2016, two years before the first crash, where some, one of the test pilots said, yeah, the aircraft designed by clowns, supervised by monkeys. But Boeing and management, you're only pilots. What would you know about the business model? So they were overruled, ignored. Now, if, if you believe all the documentaries and uh, what, what's that, Air Crash Investigator, that's, where, that's the end of it. They crashed, they died. Bad Boeing, bad regulator. No, no, there's two more layers of cheese. So we're through now to the, uh, to the next layer of cheese, which is the airlines. On the, the, the immediate prior flight to the, the um, Lion Air 610 that crashed, that particular aircraft took off from Bali to fly to Jakarta. And they experienced identical issue, issues to what the crash aircraft had. So after, just after takeoff, they got stick shaker and airspeed warnings, erroneous information, but it was only on the captain's side. It wasn't both, only on the captain's side. The captain recognised that it were false indications and handed over to the first officer. So now they're actually able to continue to fly the aircraft. Now, again, what the, uh, the reports make it sound like when you hear it in the news, that it, it all happened together. Well, it didn't. What happened first up was just this erroneous information from the, uh, the, the captain's angle of attack vane saying you're about to stall, setting up the stick shaker. Now, most people probably know what a stick shaker is. It's on an airliner, it, it vibrates to get your attention like, dummy, you're about to stall, lower the nose. So that was all happening. But he recognised it was false. Handed over the first officer. They then decided they were going to continue from Bali all the way to Jakarta. Not sure I agree with that. So then they started to accelerate the aircraft, clean up, and it's when they put the flaps up, now they satisfy one of the conditions. The MCAS says you're going to stall, starts pushing the nose down. So next minute, the, the aircraft's trying to do the old dive for the, dive for the ocean. Now, fortunately, on this particular flight, they had another pilot sitting in the, in the jump seat. Now, how often is someone in the back seat in the car? They've been the one to spot something. And he said, whoa, hang on. This, this is like a runaway stabiliser is pitching it down. And he suggested, point of, you can see in the bottom corner where I circled, there's a couple of switches. And that's there to cut out the stabiliser in case you get a runaway. So he suggested cutting out the stabiliser, and they did. Flick the switches, stabiliser froze in position, pitch down stopped, they were still able to control the aircraft using the elevators, they continued on to Jakarta and landed. So safety landed the aircraft. But they missed a golden opportunity here because what was happening is there was a faulty angle attack vane on the captain's side. It was signalling that he was about to stall and the MCAS was simply doing what it was designed to do. 
So the crew, they managed the situation, but they had no clue what was doing it, what was actually happening. They get it on the ground, now it's 10 o'clock at flight, at night, they're always in a hurry to go, go home. And because they didn't know about the system, the engineers didn't know about the system, they couldn't troubleshoot it. And so the engineers, apparently they flushed out the pedostatic system, might have checked a few uh, cannon plugs, and then couldn't fault it, because they weren't te they didn't know what to look for, testing the wrong things that were working. So how do you know, ground tested service will report for it? All they want to do is sign it off, put it back into service so it can go flying in the morning and they can go home. So they didn't really appreciate, the, the, the crew didn't say, look, this is, this is two pretty serious issues we've had here. Something is really squirrely. There was no safety culture to say, look, let's wheel that aircraft into the hangar and let's call Boeing in the morning. Just, just didn't, didn't happen. No, we'll, we'll see if we can find out. That can't fold it back into service. And guess what? The very next morning uh, was a crash. So we basically threw a third layer of cheese now we're back to the last link, which are the pilots. After the, uh, the first crash, Lion Air 610, a lot going around and eventually, not straight away, Boeing put a few things out, but then eventually they did grudgingly disclose what this MCAS was. Right? Put the bulletin out explaining this MCAS. There were a couple of mem checklists, one for, which was supposed to be done from memory, one for unreliable airspeed, which they got with a first up, and the other for a runaway stabiliser. Now they obviously just assumed that these would be enough, but they said, right, this is, this is what, they've got the system in CAS, like, sorry we didn't tell you about it, that's what's causing the problem. So if you have unreliable airspeed, do this unreliable airspeed checklist. And essentially what that means is you, you hold it, you set a 10 degree pitch attitude, the thrust is about 80%, and you sit on your hands. The aircraft's not going to stall, you use a standby to do it, it'll climb above the hills, give you a chance to get your respiration back, heart rate back under control, and then methodically go through and troubleshoot. You're putting the aircraft, as we used to call it, in a happy place, a safe configuration. So you do that. Then if you get this, the MCAS run away, all you do, flick those switches, it'll stop. So there is every indication that the pilots of the second crash aircraft, uh, Ethiopian 302, they'd seen the bulletin, they were aware of that. So they should have known. So what happened? Why did we still have the crash? Well, the very first one, Lion Air 610, they were just completely overwhelmed. What, uh, what happened was that they, they couldn't, couldn't manage what was happening. They left the thrust up at the high speed. The aircraft started to accelerate and they pulled the flaps up, not because it was any grand plan about how to manage the situation. They thought we're overspeeding the flaps. They really lost the plot and as soon as they'd done, this is happening at high speed and they just lost control, flew into the water. Ethiopian 302, the same thing. He left the engines at takeoff thrust. He didn't do this thing, throttling it back to 80%, setting it in the stable position like you're supposed to do, and and let let things stabilise. So again, the aircraft was accelerating. He correctly turned off the stabiliser switch. The pitch down stopped. But now, because he's got it still firewalled, they're going so fast that he's having trouble flying the aeroplane because the stabiliser's in a different position. So what's he do? Turns the stabiliser back on. Thank you very much. MCAS says that was the end, of, end result. It hit the ground vertically at 1,000 kilometres an hour. So let's go back to the, uh, the Swiss cheese and look at all the things at the various levels of this Swiss cheese where major errors were happening. <coughs> if any one of them had been stopped, it would have continued on. It, it, would have, it would have hit that next, next solid piece of cheese. There wouldn't have been an accident. Boeing? Most definitely was under commercial pressure to get the aircraft out and flying. Poor design, I mean, software to overcome a hardware problem, and without a doubt, deceptive behaviour. The fact that they just kept it secret because they didn't want the regulator to come down and say, no, no, it's going to cost more, um, more training, whatever, affect the business case. The regulator, FAA, under-resourced, very inadequate oversight. They just didn't do their job, made some very poor decisions again, just to rubber stamp it and let it through. The airlines, commercial pressure. pressure. They wanted to get that aircraft back out and flying. There wasn't this safety, there's something wrong here, let's sort it out first. And very definitely inadequate crew training. I mean, these things of, of uh, if you have the uh, you know, stick shaker go off stall training. I know in, in, in Qantas, 
that was hammered. We did that in the simulator so many times. It was grained into us. We knew what to do. Obviously, these airlines didn't do that. The crew weren't of that mindset that if you have this, you must do this checklist by memory. So it just wasn't done. And definitely a very poor safety culture. <clears throat> Pilots, yep, again, they didn't follow these procedures, which if they'd been done, done from memory, would have stopped the situation progressing to what it did, and they could have managed it. So very poor airmanship, but also some definite cultural issues here. And I'd, I'd say cultural, not, they're not... They're not racial issues. Both airlines, Indonesian airline and an African airline, the culture is the captain is God, the captain's boss. So you don't hand over to to your, to your first officer if you can avoid it because that's admitting you can't do it. You know, And the first officer probably doesn't speak up and say, hey boss, I reckon I've got valid information why I don't fly. It's just a cultural thing so that the captain who had all of that information in both cases continue to try to fly the aeroplane. There just wasn't this cross-cockpit cross crew coordination that perhaps we're used to, where, hey boss, you know, what about this? It, it just didn't happen. So what are, the, what are the conclusions? Well, I mean, these were accidents that should never have happened, and, uh, you know, I hope there's no one here from Boeing, but it, it's very definite you can call it. At every stage, uh, through that process, Swiss cheese, there were people or organisations that if they'd if they'd done their job or sort of said, if I'm going to do this, let's be transparent about it, whether it was the engineers designing this MCAS. So I'm transparent, you can say, is that such a good idea? What about this? Or some of the next stage, Steve says, well, Boeing, I don't agree with your, your thing. The fact that that's, you're going to put it in the manual, I don't agree. So every stage, instead of, I won't say necessarily handballing on, but people could have done something that could have stopped it getting through. It should never got to the stage where the pilots were left in that, uh, that situation. I mean, you could call it 2020 hindsight. The, in the end, uh, the aircraft was, was grounded for 20 months and it cost Boeing $20 billion. Now, that's, that's what the actual grounding did. Now, there's still, obviously, all the, the suits going on now. It still hasn't gone away. So it's, it's cost Boeing big time. So what have they done? The aircraft's flying again. Well, they've made the crew aware of what the MCAS is and what it does in the sending manuals. It needs basically input from both veins, the captain's angle attack vein and the first officers. And they've got to, got to agree. If they don't agree, we don't, nothing happens. There's an alert to the crew that it's actually operating. The MCAS is, is pushing the nose down, it's awareness. The power to the stabiliser is reduced to back it originally was and it only operates once. If it operates, that's it. Whereas be, what was happening, it continued to operate, kept pushing the nose down. So all these things that that should have been done right in the first place, uh, weren't done. So the lessons? I mean, this, this Swiss cheese is not unique to aviation. It's, it's where it started. Apparently the nursing uh, that's used in hospitals and that sort of stuff. But it's just making people aware of where, where they fit into the chain, that they've all got a responsibility that, that, that not just accepting something, handballing it on, or just a, being aware of the implications. Now, our aviation is pretty safety oriented, it's perhaps health and a few others. but. Everything that comes through can have an effect down downstream, being prepared to actually do something, say, and ask some questions. So, yeah, the Swiss cheese, in this case, it there's some pretty big holes in it all the way through, and the accidents happened, which they never should have.